something up here? There we go. I think I pulled it. So there we go. This is what happens when you put the technology guy on the stage. So his love never fails as I adjust things here. I want to, before we begin, I want to share a quick word. I know we've had many words this morning, and that's awesome. I love to hear how God's word informs our lives. But I want to share with you from 1 Timothy chapter 5, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And I want to ask that you guys would be in prayer for your pastor, Pastor Sean, and also for Pastor Francis, who is at this very moment preaching and teaching the Word of God. So when you don't see us, know that God is still using us. And so continue to pray because we need those prayers, especially when we are in unfamiliar places. You know, it, it's easy to adjust things and know that the guys are going to take care of things in the back and that your, your team is in place and things will work. But when you are somewhere else, sometimes things go awry. But God praying and God will cover it. So pray for Pastor Francis today and we're going to pray for him and pray for Pastor Sean as he recovers from a move, having moved many times across uh, lots of different areas of the country. I know how uh, uh, tiring it can be uh, to the point where I don't want to ever move again. Like, I, if there's a way for me to stay exactly where I am right now and never think about moving, I will try and figure it out. The only thing that will move me will be God. Amen. So let's pray, and then we will get right to work. Father, we thank you this morning for our pastors. We thank you for men who are doing your work because of who you are, not for their own territory building, not for their own uh, egos or recognition or for any of those things. They do it because you, God, walked before them and showed them how they should live, that your word would continue to inform the actions of their lives and that you would use them in whatever capacity that you can. God, we pray blessing, honor, healing, and protection over them. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 So today, uh, we're continuing with our discussions and, and our conversations and our sermons uh, around uh, what is happening to the early church. So we've been talking over the last few weeks about the, the AD series that's on television. But in all honesty, folks, open your Bible to the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, you will see the story unfold in ways that you don't see the story unfold on TV. I am not a TV watcher, so I have been making myself watch uh, AD, and I'm enjoying certain aspects of it. I love the idea of being able to put a face to some of the things that happened in the Bible. I think that that is interesting. I, I love stories. I love storytelling. So the ideas that they bring up around the various people that are, ha that are uh, around the periphery of things. So you have the apostles, of course, but you've got a lot of discussion around uh, Caiaphas, the high priest, and Pontius Pilate, and all the political intrigue and stuff that's happening. That, of course, you, you know, that's not captured here right? Uh, but from a storytelling perspective, it's well executed. I, I am enjoying watching those aspects take place. One of the things, though, that I kind of bristle at, and my wife laughs whenever we watch uh, things like that, is sometimes there's a little bit of extra. <laughs> or on, instead of the extra, sometimes there's a, a piece that's missing. And so I'll share with you just a quick one. When the, the Holy Spirit descended like fire from heaven as they were on the day of Pentecost praying, 
And the fire came, and they began to speak in foreign tongues. I loved watching that moment because I always have tried to envision how does that look when the tongues of fire began to touch them and, and they began to uh, speak in, 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 in different languages. And I wondered how they would handle that. And you could actually hear the change in what they were saying and, and the different uh, uh, language inflections as they were talking. And you, you, know, you kind of saw people outside like looking around and the fires swirled around the outside of the building. It was, it was awesome. But the thing that they missed was when Peter came out from the upper room and he came down to the people. There was a sermon that he gave in the Bible. <laughs> But I would assume for the sake of time, they did not have Peter preach a sermon. But for me, it was like, oh, if you just added a little bit more, how much richer would it, would, would it have been? So as you are sharing and talking to people about what they may be watching as they see AD, make sure, as Paul Harvey says, you are giving them the rest of the story. Make sure that you give them what God has actually done and what he has actually said and not just leave them in the Hollywood prepackaged uh, vision of what happened to the early church. So when uh, we last left off we, in, in, in the series, we were in chapter 7. So for those of you who are, have been watching and following along, they were in chapter 7 uh, in, uh, two weeks ago. And that was when they introduced Stephen, a man full of the Holy Spirit. And they, got, they captured Stephen and they brought him before trial. And then they stoned him. Stephen gave an impassioned sermon before men who were above his station. Because Stephen was not a pastor. He wasn't a preacher. He wasn't a prophet. He was a, he was a deacon. But see, here's the thing about that. You've got to let God's word inform your life. It doesn't matter your station. It doesn't matter your position. It doesn't matter where you find yourself. You've got to let God's word inform your life so that when you find yourself in the trial, which we'll be talking about today, you find yourself in the midst of the storm, what will come out of you when squeezed will be God's word. What will come out of you when squeezed will be the words given to you by the Holy Spirit so that lives will be changed not because of how well you present yourself and not because of how nice you look, but because of what God has put in you. So Stephen had been stoned and he was about to be buried. His death had been a tragedy. It showed, but one of the things that it showed was that there was something different about the followers of Christ. There was something different about those who followed after the Nazarene, as they continued to call him, followers of the way. Many new members were brought in. Many new people came to the church as a result of that. Even in the weeping and the wailing and the burying of Stephen, there were many new people that were brought in that came into the fold as a result because they understood that something was fundamentally different about what they were saying. And it was changing lives, and it was really changing the scope of what they believed. Their worldview was being expanded beyond the confines of the religious uh, uh, boundaries that had been set. And so, of course, when that happens, there's conflict, there's change, there's a little bit of tension. So you've got leaders who are established, they're in place, and they're trying to figure out, okay, now this new thing is happening, and it's pulling people away from our understanding of how things should be set. I mean, you got to remember, cultural Judaism, okay? Their understanding of who God is is fundamentally not what we believe. Okay? I get it that we have a common lineage, but... Christ makes the difference. I attended a, a graduation uh, yesterday, and a pastor got up to give an invocation. And I thought it was interesting because, you know, you don't, for me at least, I don't remember seeing those types of things happen. I know it happened at my graduation, but my college was founded by, by nuns, right? So, like, there's an expectation that there will be an invocation and, and all of those things will take place. But in this context, I did not expect to have a pastor get up and pray 
over the, the, the people who were graduating and over the, the teachers. But the one thing that was missing was in Jesus' name, amen. Christ changes everything. And that is where the tension comes in. That's where the, the, the squeezing, that is where the uncomfortableness of conversations that we have to have comes from. Because we can preach all day long saw, uh, the, the Proverbs. We can, we can preach through the wisdom books of the Bible and share good nuggets about financial planning. And we can tell them about how you need to be wise in your choices. But where does the wisdom come from? That's where the difficulty comes in. And that's what happened here. The established groups were not prepared for the change. They did not want the change. They didn't believe in what had taken place. And so enters Saul. In the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, it says, And Saul approved of his execution, talking of the execution of Stephen. And after that, there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. He was ravaging the church destroying people, burning homes, dragging folks off to prison, having people beaten, having them stoned, killing in the name of what he understood was right, feeling complete justification in destroying that which God was building. And I know for us here in our United States context, we don't uh, have to worry about men rushing through the door, lining us up and saying, do you believe in this Christ? And based on the answer, murdering us. That's not something that we have to worry about. However, as we have seen this year and as we have seen over the years and that we have become more uh, aware of, Christians around the world do face those challenges. So what do you do when uh, the, 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 the good, the, the righteous, the children of God, those who God has said he will never leave nor forsake, those that he told he would be their hedge of protection. What do they do in those moments where they find a note on their door that says, if you don't leave by this date, you will be killed. Or if you don't pay the, the fee that you can never afford or convert to our religion, your life is now forfeit. What do we do in those moments when a good God allows bad things to happen? I'm reminded of what Jesus said, what is good? So I'm going to spend the rest of my time here in the book of James, and I'm assigning that as homework to all of you. I'm going to be in chapter 1 all the way down from verse 1 through verse 12. And I want you guys to read all of chapter 1 this week. I'm going to assign homework. Pastor Kurt assigned us homework at the men's breakfast uh, a few weeks ago. And I finally got all of my notes typed up, and I'm going to send them to him after service today. But James is telling and sharing with the church how do we deal and walk through, navigate the storms of life? And in verse 2, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Count it joy. Now, always remember, there is a difference between joy 
and happiness. Okay? The world tells us to be happy. We have songs about happiness. We have songs about being happy. We tell people to find work that makes them happy. But that is very different from joy. Joy looks at the circumstance and the situation and stands on something that is so firm and so solid that you cannot sink. Happiness looks at the situation and circumstance, and when you stand on it, you start to sink. And unless you have an increasing amount of happiness to draw on, to pull on, eventually you'll find yourself underneath of the situation. But God says to count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. That means not just the difficulties of life, but in the context to which he was written, to which he was writing those moments where for your faith, you're feeling the difficulty, for for your faith, you're being marginalized, where for your faith in Jesus Christ, you are finding yourself put on the outside, where you are going to be taken out of position or you're going to be removed from the thing that you enjoy because of what you stand for and who you belong to. Those are the kinds of trials that James was writing into. That doesn't discount the pains of life. It doesn't discount the difficulties that you find yourselves in because that joy can be grasped for those moments too. Pastor Sean has mentioned it, and I know there was an email that went around. We've been dealing with a lot of pain from a family perspective. We had to bury both of my grandmothers within a few weeks of each other. One had gotten sick and was in, at home in bed, and she was not doing well, and she continued to do worse. And while we were ministering to her and while we were taking care of her at home in her house and sitting with her and just being there for her and trying to make her as comfortable as we could, my mother's mother went to the hospital with a heart attack, and she died that day. So while in the midst of trial, we had further trial. But I tell you, family, that even in the pain, God continued to move. He brought in pastors who came for my grandmother in Baltimore, a pastor who had served her for many years, and a church family of which she was a member since the 90s. She was saved in that church. She served in that church. She walked to that church every week, and they loved her. And they have loved the family as a result. The the newer pastor that's there now was a boy from the neighborhood. (laughs) A kid who was friends with her son and sat under her table and tried to eat her out of house and home. But he remembered Mom Doris, and he remembered the wonderful things that she poured into people. And I and and I was asked to speak during both of the funerals, and I didn't know, you know, it's like this is my grandmother, right? So in that moment, I want to just sit where you are, and I want to cry, and I want to shout, and I want to lament the fact that the glue in my life, the 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 anchor point, the, the 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 thing that I chased after was gone. But God said, I have put you here for such a time as this. And her pastor said it during, my grandmother, Doris's pastor said it during his his message to the church. That, you know, mom Doris did something that I couldn't do, that none of the pastors of the church could ever do. He got you to church. She got you to church. (laughs) And so in that moment, they were able to hear a message from two pastors who served God and understood who God was and shared what God can do in your life. And people are still having conversations about what God did that day. Count it all joy. The testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect. That means that you've got to stand through the entire storm. You can't rush it. You can't shortcut it. You can't get away from it. You've got to weather it in order for it to have its full effect so that you can come out a diamond on the other end of the cutting. 
that you would be pure gold coming out of the fire. But we spend a lot of time trying to shortcut the pain, trying to shortcut the difficulty. But God said to count it all joy. But God doesn't leave you there with some ambiguous statement of count it as joy. In verse 5, he picks up and he says, if any of you lacks wisdom. Now that means that in your trying to figure out how do I walk through this pain? How do I walk through this moment? I need wisdom. I need to understand what, how do I manage uh, with my family? How do I manage with my job? How do I manage with this this moment that's about to come where I'm going to be asked who God is? I need wisdom, Lord. And, the, and it says, if you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. That means that God will not shy away because you forgot to read your Bible that morning, and so you don't have a word for somebody. Lord, give me wisdom, and God will bring something to you to bless the person you're talking to. Lord, in my pain, I'm not able to prepare. I don't, I'm not able to sit down and pull out my, my, my concourses and, and write a word that's deep and rich, but you, God, can give me something that will bless your people. And he will. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. When you try and figure it out on your own, when you try and manage it in your own strength, when you try and manage it in your own wisdom, when you try and manage it in your own ways, and you don't let God's word, and you don't let God's people, and you don't let those things inform your life, trust me, you will be like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. If you have lived long enough, there was a time when this thing was good for you, and that thing was bad. And now... This thing is okay and good for you, and that one's no good. You will be blown and tossed by every new teaching. You'll be blown and tossed by every new application of God's word, every new video series, every new this, every new that. You will be attracted to all of these various things when God is saying, just ask in faith for my wisdom and let my word inform your life. Because I can tell you as someone who has been blown and tossed by the wind, it's tiring. It's wearying. But you, family, I would offer this to you this morning. Let God's word inform your life. Let it determine your, make, help you with your decisions. Let it, uh, stop saying Jesus is my co-pilot and let him drive the car. Because the Bible says that that person that's blown back and forth, it says they're picking up. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Unstable. Unstable. So yesterday, my, my youngest daughter, she tried out for a gymnastics team. And one of the things that has been a challenge for her is the balance beam. She loves gymnastics, and I think she has great balance. But for some reason, when she gets perched up on that bar, everything kind of goes out of whack. But over the last few years, I've watched her stop being that unstable, like unsure, not having a firm grasp standard uh, uh, to measure herself by. I've seen her become more and more confident in where her foot falls because she knows on what she stands. That that beam is not going to collapse under her her little frame. 
And so I say the same thing to you. Don't be unstable. Know what, on what it is that you stand. That's why I keep going back to let God's word inform your life. Get it inside of you. Learn what it means for the choices that you have to make. Let it, know, let, let it inform you of all of the things that are going on in your world, because I tell you, it is relevant. I know, 2,000 years ago, written over so many thousands of years by so many different people, and they played the telephone game to get the translation that you're working from. And trust me, I have heard many ex uh, excuses of why not to believe. But I tell you the truth, nothing... There's nothing that I've ever stood on. There's nothing that I have ever let become part of who I am. There is nothing that I have ever put my time and my focus on that has informed my life more than the Word of God. The Word of God is true. Amen. The Word of God is real. The Word of God is a standard by which we can live our lives. But you've got to get it inside of you. You've got to know what it is. Picking up in verse 9, let the lowly brother boast in his ex ex exhalation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. So don't let your situation or your circumstance cause you to either boast or, 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 or curl back. You're, you know the, the ebbs and the flows? We talk about the ebbs and the flows of life. Things go up, things go down, things go up, things go down. But God's standard is straight as an arrow. So no matter what comes, stand. In this case, James is writing and he's talking about the, the, the ones who are poor, the ones who are, 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 are not as affluent in, their, in the area to which he is writing. And he's saying, you know, you should boast in that because that means that you have a greater reward that is coming. And he says to the rich, understand that that greatness that you think you have and if you let that greatness, that richness, that prosperity inform your life to such a degree that you forget, understand that your humiliation will come as well. Harkening back to the Old Testament, or I guess in, in Jesus' parable, where he talks about Lazarus and how Lazarus was, was in heaven. And the rich man was saying, Lazarus, come. Can, can I just have some water? And, 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 and the word informs you that, hey, you had all your riches during your life. And that was what was important to you. And now the chasm is so great that you can never breach it. You will forever be separated. So don't let that, don't let your uh, supposed station in life take you out. For the sun rises with the scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will a rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Chasing after the corporate dream, chasing after the American dream, chasing after big money, mo money, will not save you. And having spent many years working in the finance and banking industry, it didn't save them either. So don't concern yourself with the ebbs and flows of this life because God has planted you like a tree. He brings water that cools. You will yield your fruit in due season. Your leaf will not wither. And then he ends it with, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Remain steadfast in your storm. Remain steadfast in the difficulties of life. I know it's painful. I know it hurts. I know you don't like it. But remain steadfast because of who your God is. 
God's character is impeccable and good. And he gave us the freedom to choose to love him or reject him. Our freedom, the freedom that we have as humanity, means people will make bad choices. Sin will occur. Suffering will occur. Difficulties of life will come up. But God allowed his only son to die to bring us back from the separation that sin had caused. That wide chasm, he laid down across it so that he would be our bridge. Through no activity of your own, no righteousness of your own, no ability of your own, you did not earn salvation. You didn't earn it. And to be perfectly honest, he is the one that keeps you in his hands. He's the one that keeps you and presents you before himself in glory. He is the one that holds on to you. That's why it's joy, saints. It's joy because I know I'm going to mess up. I know I'm going to make mistakes. I know that I'm going to offend. I know that I'm going to say things that you may not like. I know I'm going to say things for which I should repent. But God has me in the palm of his hand, and he holds me there so tight that I can't shake myself loose in my sin. And that is why I, am, I can walk without worrying about falling, because I know on what I stand. Despite forgiving us, though, Sin still remains in the mortal body. It's still part of who we are. It's still part of our nature. But God says you're new. And he says that you've got a new nature. All you've got to do is put that thing on. All you've got to do is get into his word and understand what he's telling you. Let it inform your decisions. Because you cannot let the Bible inform your decisions and still stumble. And even in that, God uses trials to transform us to be more like him. We walk through storms like the guy in the, the image up there walking through a lightning storm with an umbrella, because, of course, an umbrella is going to help him in a lightning storm. But God walks with us through the trials. He's making sure that with every harsh wind that blows, he's shaping us. And every, every time we hit elbows against each other as family and we're a little sharp against each other, right? We're still being honed day by day, made better day by day through the trials being weathered and made, made the rough edges smooth and make the sharp corners a little bit softer. He's transforming us to be more like him a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Therefore, rejoice in your trials as they conform you to his image. Rejoice in your trials because they conform you to his image. Rejoice in your trials because they conform you to his image, shaping you molding you, chiseling some of us that are a little bit harder, that, that the, 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 the clay is no longer moldable, right? So now he's got to get his chisel out. And if you've ever seen a guy chiseling a piece of stone, that is not an easy process. So, ow. Ow. The process is not easy. I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't be doing it that way. I should be doing it this way, right? So, Ow. Because with every ouch and with every pain point, it proves to you and to me that he loves us. What do you do with something you don't love? Toss it aside. Doesn't matter. It's not important. You buy something from the store, it only costs a dollar, it's not really that matter that much, it's, it's inexpensive, it's not something you use, it's just kind of a throwaway item, right? We call it a throwaway. So he throws it out. So you throw it out. But if it's something that you love, 
something that you want to have around. You, you, you take care of it, number one, and even when it breaks, you, you try and find the pieces of it that, can I find an original part to this 57 Chevy so I can get it back on the road? That's from my dad later because he's working. He wants to work on his. That thing that I want, that I love, I'm going to safeguard and I'm going to find all the pieces to make it do its thing to its great glory so that I can use it and enjoy it and be with it for all of my time. As he is chiseling you through the storm, as he has blown you in the whirlwind of activity, as he is shaping you day by day, know it is because he loves you that you are going through those things. And when you get to that point where it, it, it becomes overwhelming and you're like, okay, I can't stand through this anymore. That's why we're here. That's why we're here as a family. That's why we're here as church family. That's why we're here as a body. For when those moments where I am like so woozy and the, and, and the wind is blowing me and I'm starting to get dizzy because I can't take it anymore, somebody can run up and just kind of hold me up so that I don't get blown over. And if the two of us stand together in the midst of that storm, we're able to better weather it. But if hundreds of us gather together under the same banner, fighting through the same storm of persecuting persecution, fighting through the same storm of difficulty, we can stand for an even greater period of time and be honed and, and built and, 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 and shaped. How great is the unity that God brings in persecution? And that's why in the countries where Christians are more marginalized and where difficulties come into play, the churches grow. The churches in China grow. My cousin just got back from China on a missions trip. The church is growing under government oppression when the government has propped up its own Christian interface and said, this is the Christianity that you should follow. The underground home churches continue to grow. Christians in the Middle East continue to stand for Christ, knowing what it means. And they continue to share who Christ is, knowing what it will take away from them. It might not even cost them their lives, but what it could cost them is complete removal from social structures. You can no longer go to the store and buy bread. You can no longer go and do business in the marketplace because as a non-Muslim... We don't want anything to do with you. So no, we might not kill you, but we'll make sure you die anyway. But they continue to grow. They continue to share who God is. And that's why God's commandment to us and what he told us to do in Matthew 28, which I continue to harp on, is to go and make disciples. That is what we are called to do. That's how we walk this out. Because if I grab a hold of a brother here in the church and the two of us are walking through things, I'm going to run up against something that I don't have an answer for and I'm going to be able to turn to him and he's going to be able to give me an answer. Or if he doesn't have the answer, we'll sit down and talk it through. And if even after we look through the word, we can't find it, we'll go find somebody else and let the word of God inform our life. But the, the, the benefit of our prosperity as Americans is that we live lives isolated from each other. So churches don't do that because, hey, I can get online and I can find a hundred different resources to study the Bible. I don't need to talk to my brother about it because I can go search for, you know, steadfastness. And then it'll give me a whole Google search of all the places where steadfastness is. That's great. But living it out, walking it out, will bear greater fruit in your life. Because that is what God said we need to do. So do not forsake the gathering of believers. Do not walk away from your brothers and your sisters. Do not walk away from your family. And know that there will be occasions where we might not like each other. 
it is bound to happen. Anybody that has walked with me for any stretch of time knows that there are moments where you just don't like Carlton. It's okay. I don't mind. I'm not offended by that. What offends me is when you don't like Carlton and then I never see you again. That offends me. Come tell me that you don't like me. And let's talk about why. Because maybe I've done something to you. But if I don't know what I've done to you, I can't do anything about it. I can't, I can't repent. I can't go before God and say, God, I, I, I was wrong to my brother. You know, forgive me and show me how I can get forgiveness of my brother. I don't know what I did. But when you come to me and you say, well, Carlton, you know, this is what happened. We had this conversation. And then I can say, well, all right, I I get you. I hear you. Well, this is what was going on at that moment. And, 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 you know, but, but hey, if you took offense to that, let me apologize. Let me stand before you right now and say, I did not mean to offend you, but I did. Forgive me. Or, or. Maybe I'll say, this is what was going on in my world at that moment. And you'll go, man, I didn't realize you were under that kind of burden. I'm no longer offended by that. Yes, it hurt when that happened, but I did not realize the amount of pressure you were under. And so, hey, it's, it's, it's squashed, it's even, I get it. Because at the end of the day, one of the last things I told the family at my, 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 uh, my, my mom's funeral uh, just this last Monday, I said, guys, it doesn't matter anymore. All the pain, all the hurt, all the things that uh, uh, you might not have liked, it's over. That casket is closed. You cannot speak to her again. You're not going to be able to tell her you're sorry for the mistakes that you made. And she can't apologize to you. So get it done before they close it. Get it done now. Let's pray. Father, I pray right now, knowing that you are able. You are the God who builds. You are the God who destroys. You are the God who has a time for everything. So, Lord, we stand in need of you this morning. Because no matter where we sit this morning, we are either coming out of a storm, we're in the midst of a storm, or there's a storm on the horizon. So, God, give us the strength to be steadfast in that storm. Because God, our joy is made complete because you love us enough to walk us through the storm. So for my family, I pray this morning that you would bless them, that you would keep them, that you would cause your face to smile upon them, even in the midst of their pain, that you would be there so that they could see you and count this moment of pain as joy because you are there with them. And God... Lift us up so that we would know you, that we would let your word inform our lives, that we would let it shape our situations and our circumstances, that you would, that it would inform and be a lamp unto our feet, as it is said. Let your word be that which we stand on so that we don't have to be concerned about every whim and wind that blows. So here we stand, God, in need of you because it is because of your righteousness that we're saved. It's because of your glory that we have our being. It's because of who you are, the chief aim of our life.
that we worship, that we share as family, that we gather together week after week and day after day. Let doors be open, God. And give us the strength to walk through them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, Frank, can you come up? Is he still inside? Thank you, Frank. You can just... I want to ask the ministers to come forward, and we want to pray as a family. Because I know that there are folks who need prayer. I can tell you last week, as the service was ending, and I was kind of milling around, uh, Pastor Kurt grabbed a hold of me. Knowing what I was going to be doing, I was going to be going to preach at my grandmother's funeral, and he grabbed me, and he would not let me go, and he prayed for me. And I needed that prayer. So I will never let a service end and not allow time for God to move and for us to be prayed for, because that's why we're here, to stand together as family. So if God is moving on your heart, if you are going through a storm and you need prayer, if you've just come out of a storm and you want to share what God showed you through it, or to prepare you for the storm on the horizon, these ministers are here for you. And if you want, turn to somebody that's nearby. They're family too. And just say, and just pray with them while we stand up here and we, and we pray with the body. Just turn and pray together and say, God, take my brother and my sister through their storm. So can we do that this morning? So everybody stand, please.